Joe was just eight years old when his father died. He inherited the family business. He had some good teachers, including his mother, who helped him along the way while he got his education for the day when he would fully take over the business. His, must, his mother must have been a very devout woman, seeing the way that Joe eventually turned out. When he was but 16, he realized that something was missing in his life, and he began a quest to seek out what it was in his family's past that had made the business so good back in the day. By the time he was 20, he had a business plan that called for the firing of the bad managers that had taken com the company away from the real purpose and task. He had to change much, of the bad man much that the bad managers had built up. He tore down the infrastructure that had come with the self-serving managers. In fact, he had to travel quite a bit during that time just to see that the job was done and done correctly. Before he was 26, he realized that those old managers had allowed the base of operations to get in great disrepair. He had been saving for a massive renewal for headquarters. And so he ordered the work to begin. And during the process of refurbishment, some of the workers came across that original business plan. Joe read the original plan and realized how much the company had gotten away from really fulfilling the destiny of the company. He called some of the directors of the company and asked if the business could be saved. And they approached their largest creditor and asked him if the company could be saved or if the company was going to go into bankruptcy. The creditor informed Joe that because of his humility and honesty and because he didn't try to hide anything from him, Joe and the business would be allowed to continue while Joe was the president and tried to conduct the business in a very honorable way. The business was reformed. It was restored from top to bottom. And King Josiah led one of the great restoration movements of all time. That story of Josiah from 2 Chronicles 34 and 2 Kings 22 provides just one biblical example of God, the creditor, and his creation. As Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun. The story of mankind is one of faithfulness, Falling away, bondage, repentance, restoration, 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 faithfulness. Are you starting to get the picture? That is the picture of Israel during the time of the judges and the kings and it has been the picture of the church for over 2,000 years. Will we ever learn? I don't have time to rehearse all of the last 4,000 years or even the last 2,000 years. But perhaps we can skim the surface of the last 200 years or so and learn some lessons. Let's look first of all at the Restoration Movement from 1800 to 1900. One can only understand what Josiah went through by looking at where he started. When Josiah became king, he followed his father Ammon, who had only reigned for two years. His grandfather Manasseh, though, had reigned for 55 years. Manasseh was one bad king. Listen to what 2 Kings says about Manasseh. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. For he rebuilt the high places that Hezekiah his father had destroyed, and he erected altars for Baal and made an Asherah, as, king, as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. And he worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord, and he burned his son as an offering and used fortune-telling and omens and dealt with mediums and with wizards. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. And the carved image of the Asherah that he had made he set in the house of the Lord. The writer goes on and says, Manasseh led them, that is Israel, astray to do more evil than the nations had done whom the Lord destroyed before the people of Israel. 
When Josiah took over, he tore down the false altars. He got rid of the high places. He killed the false prophets and all those involved in the worship of false gods. And he restored the Passover feast. The early part of the 19th century was not a good time in this country. Time limitations allow me only to say that morals were probably at an all-time low. Churches were few and far between. The idols of the religions of Europe have been brought to America in all of their divisiveness. And perhaps the greatest illustration of that divided state of what, we, what called itself Christianity came from that time that Thomas Campbell, the Presbyterian preacher, offered the Lord's Supper to Presbyterians he found in a community where he was preaching. You know the story. Campbell was not just a Presbyterian preacher, he was an old, light, anti-burger, seceder Presbyterian preacher. He became friends with some other Presbyterians, and when having a communion service, he invited those other Presbyterians, who were not old, light, anti-burger, seceder Presbyterians, to participate. And you know what happened. He was censured by his church for that action. Shortly before that happened, Barton Stone and some others down in Kentucky had a problem with the synod of which they were a part, and they withdrew to be Christians and Christians only. An awakening was taking place in this country, in New Hampshire, in Vermont, in Pennsylvania, in Kentucky, Connecticut, Virginia, a movement that wanted to abandon all denominational names and structures and simply wanted to go back to the Bible and be called Christians and be called Christians only. And in that now famous meeting to discuss what some were going to do about getting away from denominational schemes and practices, Thomas Campbell was the one who said that this group of like-minded brethren should follow but one rule, and one rule only. He said, that rule, my highly respected hearers, is this. Where the scriptures speak, we speak. And where the scriptures are silent, we are silent. I'm sure you remember the rest of the story. It was like someone had gone through a time warp and turned on a light bulb to replace the candles and the oil lamps in that room. They said it got so quiet in that room as Thomas Campbell sat down, and then Andrew Monroe, a seceder bookseller and postmaster at nearby Cannonsburg said, Mr. Campbell, if we adopt that as a basis, then that is the end of infant baptism. Now, Campbell didn't see it that way. He did say, if infant baptism be not found in Scripture, we can have nothing to do with it. At that time, he thought he could still prove it. Upon which Thomas Atchison, a man of whom it was said, had a warm heart, rose and said, I hope that I may never see the day when my heart will renounce that blessed saying of Scripture, suffer the little children to come to me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And then overcome with emotion, he broke into tears. James Foster then took the floor and said, Mr. Atchison, I would remark that in that portion of Scripture you had quoted, there is no reference whatever to infant baptism. And at that, Atchison, in tears, left the room. All of a sudden, as Jim North says, they realized the issues that were before them rested on some deep emotional attachments. But they decided that they would adopt Campbell's rule. Where the scriptures speak, we speak. And where the scriptures are silent, we are silent. Shades of Josiah. The thing that led to the reform and restoration of the kingdom under Josiah was threefold. First, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 34, 3, in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. Who told him about the God of David? I don't know. Somebody did. Secondly, 2 Chronicles 34, verses 3 and 4, in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images. He got rid of foreign gods and foreign practices. Thirdly, in his 18th year of reign, 
the high priest Hilkiah found a book of the law of Moses in the temple. Imagine, God's word was lost in the house of God. For so long, how long, we do not know. Did you hear what I just said? God's word was lost in the house of God. In case you missed that, I'll say it again. God's word was lost in the house of God. The, solemn, the so, similarities to today are so obvious, I will not comment on that one. But now that God's word was found, they read it. The king repented and read the word to the people, and the people repented. And more reforms took place as the people and their king sought to speak where the scriptures speak and were silent where the scriptures were silent. Of Josiah, the Bible says, Now before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his might, according to the, all the law of Moses. Nor after him did any arise like him. I think it would be very difficult for us to find men who were more dedicated to God at a difficult time than the Restoration Movement fathers. They were going against everything that their generation and generations before them had taught. They were swimming upstream. But with the Bible as their guide, that is exactly what they did. And like Josiah, they changed the landscape of what was called Christianity. The vision took root and it began to grow. Let me show you how this movement, the Restoration Movement, grew in just the decade of the 1850 to 1860. If you look there, in the state of Ohio, the Christian churches grew in 10 years 305%. Baptist churches grew 2%, Methodist churches 53%, Presbyterians 13%. In Indiana, Christian churches grew 85%, Baptist churches 17%, Methodist churches 61%, Presbyterian churches 16%. In Illinois, Christian churches 114%, Baptist 61%, Methodist 117%. Presbyterian, 74%. Kentucky, Christian churches, 174. The Baptist actually lost churches during that decade. The Methodist grew by 26%. The Presbyterians, 11%. In Pennsylvania, Christian churches grew 228%. Baptist, 90%. Methodist, 76%. Presbyterians, 28%. James DeForest Murch tells us that by the close of the Civil War in 1865, Christian churches numbered 200,000 members. That was less than one half percent of the population. Ten years later, that number had grown to 400,000 members. Twenty-five years later, by the year 1900, Membership had grown to 1,120,000. Merch says that that was a number that America could not discount or ignore. The population of America at that time was 76 million. In other words, Christian churches operated 1.5% of the population. We were growing at a rate that was faster than the rate of the population. But storm clouds were on the horizon. The Restoration Movement during 1900 to year 2000. The 20th century had barely become a reality when voices of change began sounding. A look at Israel shows us that once something is fixed does not mean it will always stay fixed. This wonderful movement that was growing so rapidly, bringing people back to the Bible, uniting people with no creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, no name but Christian, hit a brick wall. In fact, there were two brick walls that it hit. The first one was with the non-instrumental churches of Christ. Six years after the turn of the century, the Restoration Movement numbered 1,600,000 people. 
That means in that six years, we grew by 480,000 people. But in the year 1906, some of the brethren who were upset with the addition of musical instruments asked the U.S. Census Bureau to list them separately. Thus, the non-instrumental churches of Christ split off their 300,000 and left 1,300,000 people of the Christian churches, churches of Christ. The non-instrumental people today number some 13,000 congregations with 1,900,000 members here in the United States. But the non-instrumental churches have continued to divide. Three-quarters of their congregations or, and 87% of their membership are described by the Encyclopedia of the Stone Campbell Movement as mainstream, sharing consensus on practice and theology. The remaining congregations can be divided into four groups, the largest of which is the non-institutional -inst group of approximately 2,055 churches. They do not agree with the support of parachurch organizations such as colleges, orphan homes, etc., by local congregations. You can do it as an individual, but not as a congregation. The next group does not have separate Bible classes. They consist of approximately 1,100 congregations. The third group does not use multiple communion cups. Approximately 550 congregations. This category overlaps somewhat with the congregations that do not use separate Bible classes for children. And then the fourth group emphasizes mutual edification by various leaders of the churches and opposes one person doing most of the preaching. In other words, they don't have preachers, everybody in the church preaches. This group includes roughly 130 congregations. Now these groups tend to have a smaller congregations on average, if you can imagine that. There are other groups also. While we were in Phoenix back in February for the CRA Bible Conference that we conducted out there, <clears throat> excuse me, I decided to sit by the pool one day and for about an hour and soak in some Arizona February sun. There was a man there who had two small children. I started talking to him and soon found out that he attended a Church of Christ in Southern California. Being familiar with that area of Southern California, I said, I'm going to guess that with that name and that location, you attend a non-instrumental Church of Christ. Yes, said the man, but then very quickly he added, but we do have a kitchen. That has to be confusing for those people. The second brick wall that our movement met was that of liberalism, modernism, German rationalism, or modern scholarship. You can pretty much pick your own word out of those mentioned. They all have various meanings, but they end up producing much the same thing, which is unbelief in the Bible as the holy inspired word of God. No longer did Moses write the Pentateuch no, it was compiled by various authors whose initials came to be J-E-D-P with a whole bunch of redactors thrown in that sorted it all out. The Gospels weren't written by, under inspiration by the authors whose names they wear, but they were copied pretty much from a mysterious Q document that no one has ever seen. Paul didn't write many of the books attributed to him. Others did, and much later than we might believe. Baptism was borrowed from the mystery cults or proselyte baptism and thus cannot be that important and can be changed by the will and the whim of man. It was no longer where the scriptures speak, we speak, and where the scriptures are silent, we are silent. It became where the scriptures speak, so what? J.W. McGarvey wrote for 17 years in the pages of the Christian Standard until his death in 1911. He wrote about these very dangerous teachings. He saw the inroads that unbelief was making. He stood tall when others bowed to the God of modern scholarship. But the infidels were ruthless. And in only six years after McGarvey's death, the liberals had taken full control of College of the Bible, where McGarvey had taught his lifetime. Division continued. Merch says it occurred in two areas, educational and congregational. 
In educational, the group known as the Disciples of Christ accepted that new scholarship of biblical criticism. And oh, we lost a whole bunch of colleges, including Bethany, Butler, Chapman, Drake, Eureka, Hiram, Lynchburg, Phillips, Texas Christian College of the Bible, and many others. New colleges needed to be started where preachers and defenders of the word could be trained. And in 1924, under the auspices of the newly formed Clark Fund, which later changed its name to the Christian Restoration Association, two small and struggling colleges were brought together in Cincinnati and formed what became the Cincinnati Bible Seminary. For the first four years of its existence, the CRA ran that school. But in 1928, the CRA helped write new articles of incorporation for the school, appointed a CRA trustee by the name of Ralph Records to be the first official president, taking over from James DeForest Murch, who had been the acting president because of his role as president of the CRA. And it is very interesting to read back in the early documentation that most of that first faculty were also on the board of trustees of the CRA. Other colleges were started, Manhattan, Pacific, Ozark, Atlanta, San Jose, Lincoln, Midwest, Roanoke, Nebraska, Louisville, St. Louis, Central. Close to 40 different schools were started. But the division also occurred along the lines of congregational congregations. And it came to a head in the 1960s when the Disciples of Christ said that if a congregation's name was still on their yearbook, and their yearbook was to be nothing more than like a telephone book giving directions and telling where our congregations were located, if their name was still on that yearbook by a certain date, they would automatically be a part of this new denominational setup. It was a CRA that was watching this and sent letters to the churches letting them know the situation, telling them how to get their church name off of that yearbook. And some of you here remember having congregational meetings in which the elders were authorized by the congregation to send a registered letter to the Disciples of Christ headquarters on Downey Avenue in Indianapolis, Indiana, and request removal of the church name from that directory. Incidentally, we did not leave the Disciples of Christ, as some of our left-wing uninformed brethren like to say. The Disciples of Christ left us. They left the faith once for all delivered unto the saints to walk in the ways of the Baals. The disciples did not like it that several thousand autonomous congregations did not want to go with them and be a part of their new denomination. So they started suing churches, hoping that they could win but one case so that they would have law precedence by which they could win other cases. Why did they sue? How much is your church property worth? Multiply that by several thousand, and you start to get an inkling of what they wanted. Thankfully, the Christian Restoration Association went to the aid of those congregations through three of our trustees, Lewis Foster, Luther Donovan Burris, and Harvey Breen. And in every case where it went to the Court of Appeals, the independence of our churches was upheld. Our churches today are free and independent largely because of the influence and the work of those three men. And incidentally, those were the first three men that we honored with the CRA's Sword and Trowel Award. Is it any wonder that we honored those men? Today, the independent Christian churches, Churches of Christ, have about 5,330 congregations with over 1,242,000 members. The Disciples of Christ have 3,754 congregations with about 691,000 members. That brings us then to the Restoration Movement from 2000 to the present. I won't deal with the Disciples of Christ at this point. They've left the faith once delivered to the saints. It's time to leave Ephraim alone. But our non-instrumental friends are beginning to face the same infidelity among their scholars that we faced in the early part of the 20th century, in part because they didn't face it when we did. They left before that happened. They had already ventured out on their own. We have always thought of those people as being extremely conservative. But let me tell you, that is changing, not in the pew as much as it is in their schools. 
Concurrently, that old infidelity is raising its ugly head again among some of our younger scholars who were not around the first time and didn't learn the lessons taught. They're sitting on a new Mars hill and spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new and not realizing that there is nothing new under the sun. The road to Jerusalem, or road from Jerusalem, is always down. Understand what I am saying. The road from Jerusalem is always down. And here comes the rub. As Peter Jennings once said, whoever controls the media controls reality. Not far from that is this. Whoever controls the definition of the words controls the argument. That was brought to our attention when our country was asked what the definition of is is. For some time now, the Restoration Herald has been documenting the downward slide of our movement. The appearance of Solifidians on our national program seems to be increasing. And why not? When their sermons are being preached in Restoration Movement congregations week in and week out, and if you wish to spell the word weak, W-E-A-K, you may do it because that's exactly what they're becoming. Whoever controls the definition of the words controls the argument. Baptism is now often taught as something that one ought to do as a way of identifying with Christ and other believers instead of for the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Whoever controls the definition of the words controls the argument. Communion tables are moved to other rooms rather than take up too much of people's times in the service. Whoever controls the definition of the words controls the argument. Most of our Bible colleges were brought into existence to produce preachers, both foreign and domestic. But preaching is no longer promoted first in many of our colleges, except in fundraising to the churches. Today, a dual vocabulary is being used, and it's often deceptive. I saw, that, saw this when I ministered in California. A new man came to be president of the school out there. The churches were upset because the college, the charge against the college was that they were not producing preachers. The new president came along and he said, we will train ministers. The people of the, of the pew thought that the word ministers meant preachers, but that was not the meaning of the word that the president gave to the word. He was saying that they were training people to be ministers or servants of Christ in whatever occupation they chose. Preaching continued to be pushed to the side. Today, the word ministers has been changed to leaders. We're training leaders for Christ, they will say. But ask them to define leaders. It may or may not mean preachers. Whoever controls the definition of the words controls the argument. Where once we had preachers who became scholars and taught preachers, and we still have some great Bible-believing scholars, now too many times we have students who have moved to the other side of the lectern and do not instill in their students the love for the word and the desire to proclaim it. J, E, D, P, and Q are being taught in some of our Bibles, in some of our Bible colleges again. How much better it would be if they would simply teach the B, I, B, L, E. Baptism has become a take-it-or-leave-it thing. In the Herald, we taught, taught several years ago, we told about a professor who wrote and said that Walter Scott's five-finger exercise was wrong because Scott had baptism between repentance and forgiveness of sins. And he went on and made the comment, we know that that's wrong because it wasn't that way in the Old Testament. Whoever controls the definition of the words controls the argument. Almost all of our Bible college personnel can say that they believe in inerrancy if they can make up their own definition of inerrancy. Whoever controls the definition of the words controls the argument. When it comes to the restoration movement, they neither know nor understand. The slogans of our movement have been distorted. They do not say in matters of faith unity. They go back to the originator of that slogan, who was a long time before our Restoration Fathers came along. 
he said, in essentials unity. And so they take that word and they say, let's use that. And then when they define the word essentials, they defy it as things only pertaining to salvation. Well, if one is going to do that, then we may as well throw out our Bibles because everything else, as one person wrote in a letter to a brotherhood publication, everything else is up for grabs. My Bible still says that all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Every part of Scripture is important for something. If not for salvation, then for edification, or sanctification, or church polity, or something else. The Word of God is important in its entirety. Things cannot be up for grabs since God has already spoken. Whoever controls the definition of the words controls the argument. Another Restoration Movement slogan so misused is, we're not the only Christians, but Christians only. In a discussion with a brother who I felt was using this slogan in the wrong way, I asked him, what is that slogan talking about, groups or individuals? He looked at me and said, what? I said, what is this talking about, groups or individuals? He said, I've never heard it asked like that. I said, well, let me give you the answer. It is speaking of individuals. The Restoration Movement has never accepted the idea that just because a group called itself Christian, that it was, but there was the thought that it is possible that there could be a person within a group who had accepted Christ in a biblical way, but because of ignorance belonged to a group that did not preach God's whole word. It is because of the wrong view of this slogan that the Restoration Movement has floundered on seas of uncertainty. Instead of giving directions to blind wanderers on the way, we have been poking out our own eyes and now we too stumble in the darkness. Whoever controls the definition of the words controls the argument. Just because someone or some group calls itself Christian doesn't make it one any more than Lincoln's dog's tail made it a leg just because somebody called it a leg. Whoever controls the definition of the words controls the argument. Today there are those who would like to see us sink into union with the evangelicals. This is another case of misunderstanding our movement. We are a movement of unity, but it is unity by restoration for evangelism. Did you get that? It is unity by restoration for evangelism. Let's say it again. It is unity by restoration for evangelism. Here's what Alexander Campbell said about this. I have no idea of seeing nor wish to see the sex unite in one grand army. This would be dangerous to our liberties and laws. For this, the Savior did not pray. It is only the disciples dispersed among them that reason and benevolence would call out of them. I'm afraid that we're not doing a whole lot of calling out these days. Last summer, an article appeared in a Brotherhood publication that said it would help us to admit that the Restoration Movement essentially failed. The reasoning of that writer was that because now there are more churches and denominations than when the Restoration Movement began, then the Restoration Movement must be a failure. Because I believe that whoever controls the definition of the words controls the argument, I must disagree with my friend. Success cannot be based on numbers in the kingdom of God. Nowhere in scripture can one find anything like that. To the contrary, success in God's kingdom is based upon faithfulness. If you came out of denominationalism into the light of New Testament, raise your hand, please. Now, those of you with your hands raised, let me ask another question. Do you believe the Restoration Movement was a failure in your life? The Restoration Movement has not failed. But perhaps we have. You may have read the following story in the Restoration Herald recently. 
Arthur W. Higby was rector of the Episcopal Church that was just across the street from First Christian Church in Canton. Through his acquaintance with P.H. Welshmer, minister of First Christian, Higby was baptized into Christ on a Sunday morning, and P.H. had him preach on Sunday night. At the conclusion of Higby's sermon, Higby baptized his own wife and daughter. How many of our evangelical-minded brethren have baptized one of the evangelical ministers that they're such close friends with? Better yet, how many have they approached and even shared the gospel plan of salvation? Have they dared to talk about the differences? Judah had many good kings. And one of the interesting things in the Bible is how many times it is mentioned that a good king did good things, but then the Bible will say this, but he did not remove the high places. Whether those high places were dedicated to the worship of false gods or they were high places worship dedicated to the worship of Yahweh doesn't make any difference. They were illegal places of worship. The worship was not the way that it should be according to God and his word. A man can do a lot of good, but in all of that doing good, maybe we need to be reminded that we're to tear down some of those high places that are around us. Have we dared talk about the differences with our denominational friends? You see, either one must be baptized for the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit, or baptism makes no difference. It is one way or the other. It can't be one way for some and another way for others. Either Peter was right or the faith-only people are right. We can't both be right about this. When we accept the faith-only people as our brethren in Christ, all evangelism ceases. As a friend of ours says, there is a difference between brotherly fellowship and redemptive friendship. Apparently, Welshmer did not have brotherly fellowship with Higby, but he had redemptive friendship. He cared enough about Higby that he, like Priscilla and Quill of old, taught the preacher the way of the Lord more perfectly. What happened to Higby? Higby resigned his church, had several ministries in Christian churches, before he died. A story is told, and I cannot find documentation of this, that when Higby realized the position of the Restoration Movement, he supposedly said, you people have the greatest message in the world, but you're the stingiest with it. If Higby did not say that, the sentiment is still true. When people hear the principles of the Restoration Movement, they're attracted to it. No creed but Christ. No book but the Bible. No name but Christian. We speak where the Bible speaks. We're silent where the Bible is silent. In matters of faith, unity. In matters of opinion, liberty. In all things, love. Call Bible things by Bible names and do Bible things in Bible ways. Back to the Bible brought restoration in the time of King Josiah. Back to the Bible brought restoration in the time of the Campbells. Stone, Smith, Scott, Jones, and others. And back to the Bible will bring about restoration in our time. Stories like that of Higby continue. He visited our church on a Sunday morning in early summer. He introduced himself as a lay preacher in a denominational church. He said, our church pretty much closes down in the summer, so I thought I'd visit around and see what the other churches are doing. That began a summer of teaching. When the summer was over, I had the privilege of baptizing Sam and his family into Christ on Sunday morning. Sam then preached on Sunday evening, and on Monday I helped him enroll in graduate school at Cincinnati Christian Seminary. He had several ministries in our churches before his untimely death. You see, brethren, the world needs restoration today just as much and maybe even more than it did in King Josiah's day. Many of you know that about three weeks ago, my mother passed away, 96 years old. 
We were ready for it. Had the talk with her many times. We'll be fine, Mom. You need to go. You know, the Bible says in the story of the fall of man that dying you shall die. And what that means is you wouldn't experience death immediately, but you're going to start experiencing death the moment you're born. That gray hair that some of you are trying to cover up, that's dying. <laughs> you know those grunts and groans you make when you get in and out of the car? <laughs> dying, you shall die. Okay? That's happening to us. Turn to the person next to you and say, you look like death warmed over. No, don't. <laughs> don't say that. That's, that's not good. But you see, dying, we're dying. We're dying, we shall die. And I watched my mother for the, about the last two years. I watched her as death came closer and closer to her. I watched her as she lost her hearing almost completely. I watched as the arthritis set into the place where she couldn't use her right arm ever again. Locked up on her. I watched her as she could no longer walk. I watched her as she couldn't remember my name. She couldn't remember who I was. I watched as these things happened. I watched as my mother experienced death. But the moment she died, she got to experience life for the first time. And folks, all around us, and I'm questioned about this all the time, all around us, I see evidence of the restoration movement dying. But you know, if we get back to the Bible, we can experience life again. We can have life like we've never had before. We have the answer. We have the message. We have the book. It's a book of life. Let's share it with all those around us. Our Father in heaven, how thankful we are that someone cared enough about us to share the word with us. We're thankful for those faithful people who've gone before us. And Father, now we pray that those who come behind us They'll find us. That once we've gone, they'll look and say, that generation, they were faithful. In Jesus' name we pray.